Tis the season to be picky. Come check out our newly released winter and holiday collection over on Creator Inc. These include a ceramic mug featuring a cozy Bernie and penguin, a super soft fleece blanket, and three penguin themed ceramic ornaments. All artwork for these items has been done by the delightful Bobby Big Potatoes, the original artist of the Picky Penguin, who I'm so thrilled to have working with us. Just like the desk pad and notebook, these items are made to order and will ship to you shortly after ordering. We spent a long time putting these designs together, and I know you penguins will love these items just as much as we enjoy creating them. Check the link in the description or YouTube's merch shelf and order yours today. Previously on the Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve. I hope she puts on her funny little outfit. If anyone has anything to hide, my special Wilson shooting eye will set, soon set them straight. I'm going to blast them. That water pistol? Oh, Rudo, this thing shoots up motos, you silly Billy. Okay, wait, what? And now back to leg at people. Hello! Sneak a bee. Back with some more of the Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve. When we last left off, holy mother of God, it turns out, it turns out that freaking Gregson was actually one of the people involved with the, the reaping, <laughs> so to speak. He was uh, one of the, the members of this group that has basically come to be known as the Reaper, or one of the people involved in setting up these assassinations, which is, uh, damn, it's pretty insane. Um, though, as you guys point out, there were indications that Gregson was willing to do seemingly anything for his country, right? He did make a secret deal with Rupert Kroger in Case 5, right? Where he basically, like, provided him with evidence so that he wouldn't reveal state secrets. Which definitely shows that he wasn't above doing some shady-ass shit if it meant, in what his eyes, protecting his own country, which I'm assuming that's what he thought he was doing here by punishing the truly evil. Um, but it does seem like that that is the case, right? That this is not some, like... Uh, some hand of fate or uh, godly wrath or something being thrown down upon these people. And it's not just some random accidents. No, they, this really is a case of uh, the government going in and killing these guys that are clearly deserving of death. No, clearly deserving of probably uh, some form of justice. But I'm guessing the system itself is flawed and they're not able to provide it. But they've, they've twisted it into this like fairy tale, right? And that's sort of how they've gotten away with this for so long. I, I wasn't actually totally sure that that's what was going, that that's where this was going. Maybe it was pretty obvious, but just the, the setups for some of these, so many of these seem like it wouldn't have been possible for them to get away with it for so long. But I suppose if the government itself is involved in this, right, the actual British government, that would mean that they could just kind of cover up any potential evidence left behind, right? I guess it's just hard for me to believe that there weren't people then that were, you know, working for the police that didn't know anything about this and didn't somehow end up finding something that was uh, incriminating. I guess maybe if they did, they would have just gotten shut, shut up by the higher ups or would have been squashed by them. Hmm, it's interesting though. Uh, but anyway, last episode, uh, Robin said, uh, Nico, wait, didn't McGundle die while she was away? How did that happen? <laughs> Egg Benedict slash Rupert Kroger. Uh, hmm, not sure. Not as though I made a, had a motive since he killed my father and I wanted to retrieve his belongings. I never would have dressed up as a bailiff and escorted McGundle to the courtroom when no one was around and set the omnibus on fire. Nope, still a mystery. <laughs> All right. <laughs> right. Right. To be honest, I could not remember if that plot point had been answered because I'm pretty sure it was Rupert Crowgre, right? He was wasn't he the also the one that killed the the pawnbroker? Um, I kind of forgot that he was also responsible for the death of McGundal. I couldn't remember if that plot point had actually been answered, but yes, it had. It had. Sorry, this is what I mean. After like a certain amount of time, the details for some of these cases do start to fade a bit, at least in my mind. Um, like I'll still remember generally who like the bad guys are. Um, but it signs the actual, like, specifics of it, uh, they don't stay. Which, hey, sounds I can get away with not remembering shit, because, like I said in before, all the previous games have been pretty much really self-contained, right? Uh, this is the first of any of these games to actually, uh, draw stuff from the previous game. Most of the time, it's just like, yeah, whatever, you don't have to play, it, it, you can play games in any order, it doesn't fucking matter, okay? Unless you want to see, like, why... Phoenix and Edgeworth hung out together and how you met Maya and fucking where Athena came from. But even then it was like, Athena was already there. It's most of the time it's just like, whatever. And let's be honest guys, we still don't know where Athena came from, okay? We still don't know what the fuck she's doing here. But Robin, th thank you so much for your, your clarifying, correcting comment. 
Yes, there is new R comment of the day. By the way, I also saw a few of you guys uh, point out the whole thing with the, the bracelet that Iris had brought up and the draw to Apollo. And yes, I noticed that. I, I think people thought I just didn't realize it because I didn't react big. Maybe you're expecting a big ha ha ha. Uh, but I, that's why I, that's why I literally said to her, you're getting ahead of yourself, Iris. Everyone in the comments was like, dude, Nico like, like, fuck, remember that? Yes, I did. I did. I just sort of rolled it off like, ha ha. I guess maybe that was too vague. But either way, yes, I, I got the reference. Oh, and the other thing, uh, in regards to Holmes's violin, <laughs> why, I was like, that part I didn't get. I was like, wait, why is she hiding the violin? It's because she just doesn't want uh, Holmes playing his music, uh, which is close to her deadline. Ah, yeah, no, that one, that one was pretty obvious. That one I definitely should have understood. But okay, so um, we still got to go talk with Asogi. Um, oh, and that's right. Uh, uh, Mikotoba did ask Naruhoto to return to Japan after this trial, which, I mean, normally there's five cases in this game. I'm pretty sure we have one more after this, so uh, that's definitely not going to be happening. At least not after this one. Though I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up returning by the end of this game. Because that does seem like, I don't know, like, th this is technically just a duology, right? So, there aren't any more games that have come after it. I don't know if they ever planned for there to be more. I hope there fucking is, because goddamn do I love the characters in this game way more than the characters in the other main series i'm sorry okay but it's fucking true okay even apollo i love apollo he's still my favorite character from the main series but i like these characters more than him i do i like pretty much all the characters here more than all the characters from the original series there are no duds there are no fucking larry's to piss me off there are no old bags and no fucking annoying pieces of shit characters well they're still piece of shit characters but they're good good kinds of pieces of shit we were like dang you're such a you're so fucking garbage but I can sort of empathize with your plight or, or something, you know? Something to work with here. The characters in this game feel like they just have so much more depth than the characters from uh, the uh, regular Attorney series. I heard that apparently for, I think, people who bought this game, like early on, there was a uh, a survey people could fill out. And one of the questions they asked was, you know, would you be down with like another game coming from the series? Uh, yeah, I bet you bet your sweet ass I filled that shit out and was like, yes, <laughs> please God. <laughs> Oh my god, and I hope that if they did, I hope they do what they did here. I'd hope they'd have like two or three games that was like revolving around a story. Um, but I would be surprised if by the end of this, Naruhoto and Susto would do end up leaving to return to Japan. But they could do another story where they come back to London, or maybe uh, Holmes and group come to Japan, or they visit another place, you know, in Europe. They go to France, they go to fucking Italy. That'd be cool, you know? I, Because I, one thing I've really enjoyed about this series as well is the change in culture, you know? I mean, besides the, you know, totally not Japan uh, fucking original series, it's really just been cool seeing this different system they have here. Um, by the way, I did see somebody mention that apparently there was a picture next to the Daruma doll in this, this room that I've missed. I can actually examine? Holy shit, there is. It's a lovely photograph we took together when I had to leave London, though it was a sad day. But happily, I have the same photograph on display in my room at home, you know. Now we're all back together again. It'd be nice to take a new photograph. Oh yes, that would be wonderful. I guess technically we have now. I have it I have it in my court record even. I do wonder how this this shit this shit honestly kind of disturbs me. <laughs> like I'm kinda terrified. I'm hoping that it's just more of like a like wait a minute. I know who I gotta ask. S somebody who knows all about something in medicine and blah blah blah. I don't know who it could possibly be. And since I can't present profiles, I just go in here and they're gonna be like, what's this picture here? Hmm, who are you pointing to specifically? Uh, point to, uh, take that. Oh, that guy, yes. Yeah, yeah. It is sort of like, oh God, why, why are you guys in here? I'm scared. I'm afraid that one of those two is like Judge Jigoku or fucking Mikotoba is gonna be evil or something. Uh, okay. So let's go talk to, oh, we gotta go to the, we gotta go to the, uh, the Mr. Vigil's place, but first go see Asogi. I want to see him. You know, he seems really kind of pissy. Uh, November 2nd, prosecutor's office. Hello. I'm over here thinking my deep thoughts. Cosma. I will say it's weird seeing Cosma without his headband. I thought it wouldn't be long before you paid me a visit, Rienosuke. Da, da, da. <laughs> oh, my theme is kicking in. I was right about what I said, wasn't I? Sorry? That you have all the makings of a great defense lawyer. Well, I... 
always believed that you fulfill your dream of advocating in the British courts. I just never imagined for one second that I would be as a prosecutor. Seeing you stand in a foreign country courtroom, so gallantly realizing your dream, Kasumasama, I'm truly happy for you. And I am truly thankful to you, Judicial Assistant Mikotoba. Actually, how old is uh, Asuki supposed to be? Uh, 24. And I'm a little younger than him, right? I've always thought that Susuto did, did seem like Susuto had a big fucking crush on Asogi. And for a while, I, I figured that, well, that crush would go away because he's fucking dead, right? Well, uh, maybe not. <laughs> but then again, it could just, it just could be more of like an aberration for just the, his work ethic and everything. It probably is because these games are vanilla as fuck. Ryanosuke. I always thought it would be fun for you and I to shake up the British legal system a little together. This isn't quite how I envisaged it, but I suppose just another twist of fate. I've learned a lot of things during my time in London. About how Susu San's father was himself a visiting student here once, along with Judge Goku. And about what happened with your father. Then you'll have no difficulty understanding why I had no choice. Why well, I had to find a way to get to Britain as a visiting student myself. I want to hear from you, Kazuma. This is the first time we're actually having a conversation outside of the courtroom. Like an actual conversation about shit. That isn't surrounded by, you know, dramatic revelations. As you wish, Rinosuke Naruhodo. Like, it's like, oh, wait, 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 wait. God, I have to do it. Kazuma, this is your armband. Actually, I think it's yours now. Sorry? You're the defense lawyer. You have a talent for it. I've always known that you would. And now, you've chosen to take that path in life. As your friend, I couldn't be happier for you. Or more proud. Kazuma, so gay! So you keep hold of that. Besides, I'm a prosecutor now. That armband would have no meaning for me. Well, if you're sure. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, I needed that shit. I needed that fucking shit. That was good. That was fucking good. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. Okay. Uh, anyway. It's getting on for a year now. This is what happened on the SS Buria. When I ate shit. We were heading across the oceans from Japan to Great Britain. Uh, when a bizarre series of coincidences led to those tragic events. I thought I'd lost my best friend forever. I must have been unconscious for a long time. When I awoke, I was lying on a bed. It was a narrow little room. There was a posy of flowers by the pillow. It took me a little while to realize that I was in the cabin of a ship. I slipped out of the room and headed up onto the deck. Were you already suffering from amnesia at that point? Yes. I didn't know what had happened or where I was. There was just this voice in my head. You have something to, you have to do, something no one else can know about. Go to Great Britain. Your task awaits you there. To Britain! It was a calling I couldn't ignore. It compelled me relentlessly. Out on deck, I saw that I was on a huge steamship, and we were docked in a large port. It must have been Hong Kong! Yes, it must have been. Presumably just before they were due to carry your body off the ship. I had no idea of the situation, but I did have the feeling that this was, in some way, my last chance. So I concealed myself among the disembarking passengers and went ashore. Then I disappeared into the crowded streets of the, the foreign port city. So I could plan my onward journey to Great Britain. The journey to Britain, to Camelot. Just under a year ago, with all my past memories lost to me, I was left behind in Hong Kong. Everything was foreign to me. The sights, the sounds, the smells. My head reeled. I was truly at a loss. I realized now that I had escaped as a dead man with nothing but the clothes on my back. No money, of course. Oh, how terrifying for you. 
Luckily, though, I had two feathers in my cap. One being your knowledge of English, I suppose. That's right. And on the back of that, I was able to pick up some work as a deckhand on a cargo ship. Eventually, after calling at countless ports, I finally arrived at Dover. That must have been some three months ago now. Your formid formidable tenacity of purpose showing itself again. I mean, the man had lost his memory and had literally nothing to his name. But he still managed to make his way to London on the opposite side of the world. Of course. I had no idea why I had moved heaven and earth to get here at that point. So, how'd you end up becoming Lord Van Zeke's apprentice then? That can only be called an extraordinary stroke of luck, really. You see, I was stopped at the border because I had no papers. They took me straight to Scotland Yard. And by sheer coincidence, Lord Strongheart was there to attend a meeting. That's when the second feather in my cap came into play. Would that have been your knowledge of the law? Yes, exactly. Lord Strongheart was curious about an Easterner with intimate knowledge of British law. He took me back with him to the Supreme Court and assigned me to the prosecutor's office. What do you do? Ask you like 10 questions or something? How do you... You're just like out there and like, I know about jury systems and the burden of evidence and hoogity boogity boogity. And Strongheart's like, well, damn. Damn, son. All right. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. You and me. Yay. <laughs> and then nine days ago, I put on this cool mask. You finally got your memory back after the trial involving Trevor. Yes, I did. Your father, Genshin. Ever since I first met you at Yume, you talked about your dream. Mark my words, Ryunosuke. I'll be chosen as a visiting student and make my way to Great Britain someday. Did you know the entire time about what happened to your father here? 16 years ago. His dad looks cool. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. When my father left on that exciting trip to Great Britain, I was just a boy. We took a photograph together the day before his departure. It's my last memory of him. But what I remember most about my father is his unswerving sense of justice. Six years after he left, a gentleman called at our family home. He told me that Genshin, my father, had been taken ill in England and passed away. It was Professor Mikatoba, your father, Sister San. Oh my! Ever since then, the professor was very good to me. He even helped me to fund my university education at Yume. I'll be forever in his debt. But nevertheless, I just couldn't bring myself to believe what he told me. Oh. Then one day, a letter arrived at our house from Britain. There was no indication of the sender, so I opened it assuming it was from an old acquaintance of my father. What I read in that letter changed my entire life. What did it say? It said that my father had been a mass murderer, and the writer cursed the Asogi name. Oh no! As a result of that letter, I found out what had been hidden from me all those years. Huh. Presumably the letter was sent from a relative of one of the victims. If whoever it was had been a member of the judiciary, he could have been present at the closed trial. Ah. The letter revealed that my father had been sentenced to death, executed for being a killer. I, I'm so sorry you had to find out that way. I imagine the British government did its very best to silence whoever sent that letter. But someone who knew the truth and couldn't bear the resentment was always going to be a problem. But still... It could have been written by anyone. Why would you believe such a thing? There was a newspaper cutting included with the letter. It was the first I'd ever heard of the professor and his terrible killing spree. Well, what did my father have to say about the letter? I couldn't bring myself to show it to him. What? Why not? I mean, Mikitoba brought up how he, he always suspected that somehow Sogi knew, right? because he deliberately concealed the truth from me by telling me my father was taken by a fatal illness. That couldn't have been easy for him, and he'd done it out of consideration for my feelings. Aw. And so instead, I showed the letter to Judge Jigoku. Ah, to the other visiting student. 
He faltered for the briefest of moments, but then he just laughed the letter off. But to that moment, I saw it on his face. He was undeniably shocked, shaken momentarily before recovering his poise. Hmm. Wow. That's just kind of cool. He was able to see through it. The re just based on his brief reaction. And then he's like, oh, wait, no, ha, ha no, it, it, was, it was fine. But it was too late. A year later, my bereaved mother succumbed to the strain of grief, and she too passed away. And that's when I made up my mind that one day, without fail, I would cross the seas to Britain and seek the truth for myself. Interesting. So I guess she probably never knew about it either, did she? I mean, I'm guessing she died because her, you know, she's a strain of grief, probably the grief of her husband having died, not necessarily the grief that he was also a serial killer. The truth about my father against an Ashogi. And I wouldn't let anyone stand in my way. Oh, Kazuma sama. Not even you, now hold on, now die! What we learned today in court turned things completely on their head. It was an impressive piece of lawyering, Ryunosuke Narahodo. Lord Van Seeks isn't the Reaper, you know. I also want to believe it myself, but it turns out that Inspector Gregson himself, the victim, was... It's clear that the Inspector was behind the Reaper's activity all along. But... You mean... You knew? The real question is, who's been giving orders to the Inspector? Yes. Barack Van Six is the real Reaper. And I know that ten years ago, it was him. Who decided my father must be a mass murderer and sent him to his grave. No, he was merely saying that justice was done as the law dictates. He's not to blame. Really? He actually does think it's him. I thought he was playing along with it. No, he really does. Interesting. Okay. No, I think, I think the... In that case, it, yeah, th this shit is truly in-house, right? In the highest echelon of this uh, country's hierarchy. I mean, more than likely, it's probably coming from Strongheart, right? Ultimately, it's people who condemn people. The law is just a tool that they use to do it. And when a man condemns another, he must take responsibility for his actions. Of course he must. But I know for certain that my father would never have taken another man's life. Kazuma. On the contrary, my father's life was taken by the Reaper. Interesting. So he thinks that his father was killed by the Reaper, right? Which is in a lot of ways is the actual British government. Um, he seems to deny that his father did any of this, though. I don't know. I mean, we technically don't really know for certain that he didn't. Um, all right. So what should I show him? How about Gregson's dead body? The Reaper. At last, I get to take my revenge. Kazuma, Lord Van Six isn't responsible for your father's death, and he's not the Reaper. He's defended and deserving of a fair trial. You mean like the one my father had? It's a close trial now, too. The conditions are exactly as they were ten years ago. And even if it ruffles some feathers, I have a plan to show that man for what he really is. Kazuma. Hmm. Okay, so... Yeah, wow, he really is convinced. I, I really thought he was just rolling along with it, but no, he he is absolutely convinced of Vanzik's guilt, which is probably good. You know, I think it's it's to have that conflict between him and Naruhodo, I think it's good because that makes it more interesting. If it was just like, oh, I'm just rolling with it. We're going to find the truth together, like, you know, Edgeworth and Phoenix do later on. And I think it's good that because he has such a vested interest in this. And of course, he wants to believe that his father was not that kind of guy, right? He was not that the man that he fears he is. Cosmo, what do you make of this? There's only one place where defense lawyers and prosecutors should discuss evidence. The courtroom. So it seems you're still confused by the situation. That's what I make of it. That's funny. I, I like that I actually showed in that picture. The, the picture of Gregson. And it, again, it did the same thing before where I showed it to, to Iris. And it didn't show up in the top left corner like it usually does when it means I showed him something different. Okay. So uh, I, I thought it was just a generic answer. So this is a generic answer. That's what I make of it. This thing my friend's always going to have an edge over me, isn't he? Was well, there something I have to do? Because I, I definitely... Oh, wait, is there something in the room? Maybe this? Oh, yeah, this. What, what the... It's a skill model of the crime scene. Oh, yes. I realize that. Does the prosecution office make a model of the scene for every single case? Apparently so. 
Sometimes it helps to visualize things better and notice things you hadn't spotted before. Actually, the measure of notice board is my work. Be honest, you enjoy making that. Oh, you, you know me so well. Uh, okay, I guess that's it. Your little work desk, which I can't examine. The picture. Do you know who the man the portrait is? Why would I? What? But you're Lord Fancy's apprentice. Yes, apprentice, not friend. And during the time I was suffering from amnesia, I didn't even notice that picture. Oh, really? I mean, it's not the smallest picture. I wouldn't have the first idea what the man decorates his office with. There's Laura Van Zeke's incredible, incredibly stylish desk. It's not my style, though. That's a, that's a new animation. Now, I noticed you've been working at the little table on the floor, kneeling down Seiza style. I thought it was some kind of punishment set up by Lord Van Zeke's when I first saw it. I find it the most comfortable way to work. I can't do it. After a couple of minutes of seeing my legs fold under me, they start to go to tingly. Don't exaggerate, Ryunosuke. We both know you can't even manage a minute. <laughs> Fuck you, Asogi. Lord Van Zeke's fine collection of hallowed chalices and bottles all neatly lined up. At least you're not tossing those every trial. Yes, he's extremely particular about all that. He has a strict regime for everything, from the storage of the cast to the bottling of their co contents. Gosh, you must be having a really tough time of it being his apprentice. Actually, no. Oh? He's so particular about it all, he refused to let anybody else touch any of it. So it's been quite easy for me, in fact. Talk about weird. <laughs> yes, good. You think he's about to toss all that shit and shatter it anyway, right? What do, I, what do I have to show to you? Oh, here we go. Uh, the autopsy? This came up in the trial, didn't it? As something a little dubious, I mean. The fact that no time of death was recorded on Inspector Gregson's autopsy report. Yes, there were some unexpected turns in the courtroom earlier. The suggestion you came up with certainly took everyone by surprise. The idea that the victim died the previous day at some other location is quite something. Well, considering when the pocket watch has stopped and the scorch marks on the candle, it's certainly a distinct possibility. The evidence and the scene both point to it. To be honest, it bothered me too. So I paid a visit to the autopsy room earlier. The coroner responsible wasn't there, but I got a name. It's Dr. Gory. Gory! Um, if it wouldn't trouble you, Kazuma-sama, we'd very much like to speak with the coroner, too. Of course. The last thing I want is for anything to be brushed under the carpet. Scotland Yard's autopsy laboratory is be behind Logate Cemetery. Logate... Uh, by Barclay Prison, you mean? Ah, you know it, do you? The prison where my father was incarcerated and robbed of his life. Kazuma-sama... Well, thank you. We'll pay a visit to the laboratory later today. Okay, there we go. Ryanosuke, I... I want to thank you. What for? For this. You safeguarded the soul of the Asogi clan. Well, it is a famous sword that's been in your family for generations. My only slight regret is I never got the chance to draw it before I returned it to you and fucking murdered a motherfucker. Kaurama is said to have been forged by a master swordsmith during the Sengoku Warring States period. I come from a long lineage of warriors, many of whom were expert swordsmen. Well then, you're a chip off the old block, I'd say. This blade, Kaurama, is a symbol of the Asogi clan's honor and might. Apparently, one of my father's apprentices even took the blade's name for a surname. Really? Kaurama? It does sound formidable, that's for sure. Sixteen years ago, when my father was a visiting student here in London, he had his, this sword forever at his side. Which is why it means so much to me that I have it by my side again now, too. And that is all thanks to you. It was an honor. Aw. 
Now, I have preparations to make for tomorrow. Perhaps I said a little too much. Kazuma, you've changed. No, Ryunosuke. I haven't changed at all. It's you who's changed. Ah, uh, that's cool. I can completely understand your resentment of Laura Van Zeeks given what happened. But the fact is, those events in this case are, well... Unrelated. Is that what you want to say? How can you be so sure? What do you mean? Never mind. That man is the Reaper, and it's for that reason that the Inspector was killed. I'm going to prove as much in court tomorrow. By whatever means necessary. I can't let you do that, Kazuma. I know you'll do what you have to as a lawyer, but I'm sure I don't need to tell you that I won't be taking any prisoners in the courtroom. I would expect nothing less. Until tomorrow, then, in the old Bailey. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Super good, man. That's really good. It also really helps to explain, like, his frustration when actually Naruto got the best of him, right? Like, he would, like, afterwards and be like, you know, he's impressed with Naruto, but he's still, he's still a little vain, and he still also wants to win. Like, he, he truly does believe that what he is fighting uh, for in this instance is correct. So, um, all right, let's, uh, let's go to Mr. Vigil's hospital bed. Uh, November 2nd, St. Saint Senator's Hospital, War 3. This is the war where Mr. Vigil was brought, apparently. To be frank, I'm a little worried about seeing him again. I don't know if he'd be too happy to see us. Oh. Ah, the lawyer. Hello again. Are, are you feeling better now, Mr. Vigil? Yes, thank you. Somewhat better. I'm so sorry to have caused you to... I mean, it was because of me. If I hadn't exposed your secret and forced you to remember things you've obviously tried to forget. The prosecutor was here until a few moments ago, too. He just missed him. Oh! Cosmo beat us to it. He said much the same as you. He was very apologetic. But the truth is... I brought all this upon myself. Please, don't think like that. Keeping it from Evie, my wife, all these years, I've carried such a sense of guilt, but that's not the worst of it. Over time, I also came to deceive myself as well. You mean about your dismissal? Looking back now, I'm beginning to think that perhaps Inspector Gregson didn't stumble across me by accident at all. I mean, he compensated me so generously for acting as a stand-in. He was clearly concerned for my well-being and doing what he could to help. So perhaps Gregson knew exactly what had become of Mr. Vigil all along then. I'm sure this is just deserts. Just, just deserts? Is that a, uh, a British spelling as well? Because the thing is, we, we have desert. But then we have desserts, which is with, with two S's. Do they just spell with one S? If that's the case, then why? Because in that instance, I would actually understand it being two S's, because then you can tell if it's you're saying desert or dessert. Well, whatever. I'm sure this is just desserts for the 10 years of lies and deception, but... It wasn't me that helped the professor escape 10 years ago. It wasn't me! I swear it! I swear it's true! Oh, Mr. Vigil. I'm sure you'd rather not dredge up even more from your past at this time, but... If possible, could you tell us exactly what really happened? Cass eyes are so fucking dead. I want to. I need to get all this off my chest. I just... Want someone to tell me what I should have done! Ugh. Hey! By the way, look at this. Mr. Vigil, would you mind? Uh, okay. Oh, my head is throbbing. Oh, you're killing me. Okay, sorry. Never mind. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 
Inspector Gregson was obviously engaged in a special operation of some sort. He was investigating something that even Scotland Yard couldn't know about. Details of the Reaper's marks, yes. It was when he had to carry out those investigations that I would take his identification and impersonate him. You pretend to be the inspector and carry out investigations on his behalf. Oh, no, never. A cop street peddler couldn't possibly carry out a proper police investigation. All I would do is go to the specified location and make a little hoo-ha. Just something to leave an impression. So everyone there would think a detective called Gregson was here. So, that's what you were doing on the day prior to the incident? Yes. He asked me to make an appearance at the park on Lime Street for the Red-Headed League event. So as usual, I flashed the inspector's identification around and was very vocal about my presence. Oh god, I was right you were here. <laughs> I guess it didn't show over the assertive thing. But then you were taken prisoner by those red-headed fraudsters. Yes. So, you would always make a point of showing Grex's identification and generally being loud. That's what the inspector asked me to do, yes. Well, that's one way of becoming a legendary detective, I suppose. Not a good one, though. <laughs> and as you know, I suffer this bruising around my neck at their hands. But the following day, they kept their word and released me. Without returning the inspector's identification to you, however, we had arranged to meet in the Fresno, the Fresno Street room at five that day so I could report back to the inspector. But at the agreed time, that's when I heard the gunshot. Hmm, I see. It was at midnight, June, 17th June, 10 years ago. That was the time scheduled for the ex execution. But the professor's execution never actually took place, did it? Or rather, the execution itself must have been used to affect the plan of escape. I hardly dare to imagine what a chilling plan it was. Barclay was renowned for being the highest security prison in the country. Everything that went in or out of the place was searched multiple times. But there was one notable exception. Or rather, one notable loophole. Something that was never questioned. I have a feeling I know what that loophole was now. The coffins into which the bodies of the executed convicts were placed, correct? Yes. Once the coroner had confirmed the death of a co the co condemned convict, the body was taken in his coffin for immediate burial in Logate Cemetery just behind the prison. The chief warder first had to sign the necessary papers. And after that, no member of staff was permitted to touch the coffin containing the body again. When executions took place, only the executioner and the coroner were permitted inside the chamber. I would wait in the adjacent room for word that the condemned convict was dead. On that occasion, once I had that confirmation, I went into the mortuary to find a lone coffin, as usual. The procedure was that I would sign the paperwork, having checked the coffin, then nail it shut. But for some reason that day, the coffin was already nailed shut. No. I didn't think anything of it at the time. I assumed that my deputy must have checked the coffin and nailed it shut before I arrived. So, you mean the coffin contained? Yes. I can only imagine that Sergi, having escaped his execution somehow, was alive inside that coffin. The coffin was then taken out through the main gates and deposited in Logate Cemetery. Presumably there wouldn't have been enough air inside to breathe for long. So in the early hours following the burial, Somebody dug up the coffin again to set Genshin free. But in the end, he was fatally shot in the graveyard anyway. What on earth really happened in Logate Cemetery that night, I wonder? I'm afraid I really don't know. All I can say with certainty are two things. Asogi couldn't possibly have escaped that way without help from somebody working in the prison. And that somebody was not me. Interesting. Wow, so you really didn't actually have any hand in it at all after all. Which, damn, that really makes you feel bad for him. His whole life was ruined because of this. 
and he had nothing to do with it. Obviously, you knew the man then. The professor, I mean, gets you a Asogi. Yes, I remember him well, in fact. Would you mind telling us what you know? Well, have him condemned to death as he was. Any contact I had with the man was short, obviously. After that trial, which was carried out behind closed doors, attended only by elite members of the judiciary, they called for his execution to be carried out at the earliest possible opportunity. The outcome of the trial was set from the beginning, wasn't it? It was a time of delicate diplomacy, when Britain and Japan were in the process of signing an important treaty. That meant that this potentially destabilizing case had to be dealt with swiftly and discreetly. The man had less than a week in total. As I was the chief warder, I oversaw his short stay in the cells until his final hour. I remember being struck deeply by his noble character and incredible resilience. What do you mean exactly? He was a killer of many men, but he was always quiet and polite. He was a gentleman and a man of intellect. In fact, I couldn't bring myself to believe what he'd done, so I asked him one day. Those five members of the aristocracy whose lives were taken, were you really responsible? I'm guilty of the unforgivable crime of ending another human's life, yes. Hmm. The following day, a close trial took place, and the verdict was no surprise. Really? So he actually admitted to him there that he... It, mm. So he said he was guilty. I'm guilty of the unforgivable crime of ending a human's life. Yes. It's kind of vague, though. But I don't know. It did seem like he was addressing his question, though. So I, I don't know. Maybe. Guilty. That night, when he was brought back to his cell, I saw something. Something unusual. Something unusual? What? The last will and testament of Genshin Asogi. Ooh. Asogi's well. As I said, it was on the night following his trial after he'd been found guilty. I was doing the rounds of the cells, and when I looked into Asogi's, I noticed that he seemed to have a sheet of paper in his hand. Ah, his last will and testament then, presumably. As soon as he noticed me, he hurriedly shoved it behind his back. But why did you find that so unusual? Isn't it normal for a man to pen a will when he knows his death is nigh? Yes, that's true. But there were special conditions to Asogi's incarcer incarceration, you see. What sort of conditions? That he couldn't have paper and shit? Well, even though he was held in a cell designed for condemned inmates, he was allowed to keep his personal effects with him. With one exception. Really? He was allowed his things? That is unusual, certainly. Of course, he had been convicted of killing five members of the aristocracy. But at the same time, he was a guest in our country from the Empire of Japan. The powers that be were determined that his final day shouldn't be needlessly uncomfortable. What was the exception you mentioned to the personal effects he was allowed? That's the point. He wasn't permitted to have writing materials. Specifically, no pens or paper. Hmm. So, he was prevented from leaving any written record of what had happened to him? Yes. That was the long and the short of it. I have no idea where he obtained that paper. Any writing materials would have been confiscated from him upon his incarceration. As I said, he had the paper behind his back, and they pleaded with me. What did you just hide behind your back? Please. Please. Turn a blind eye. This is my lifeline. But you know it's against the rules. You're the only person who's seen. If you just agree to keep quiet. All right, then. What's on that paper? The last will and testament. This will is the only weapon I have left now. Hmm. Interesting. Do we ever acquire that piece of paper? I feel like that's something that might come into play here at the very end. 
How can a will be a weapon? So I decided to pretend I'd seen nothing, and I let him keep his will. But then later, it just seemed to vanish without trace. What? What do you mean it vanished? It would seem that isn't the end of the story of this mysterious will. Woo! I was the only person who saw Sugi's will, but... But somehow it disappeared. It was after Sugi's execution. Which is actually an elaborate jailbreak! Wallace gathered up Asugi's possessions that were in his cell. They were all to be sent back to his family home in Japan, you see. To poor Kazuma-sama. And you're saying that it wasn't anywhere to be found among his personal effects. The will, I mean. That's right. Though I didn't search through them myself. But Governor Caden was livid. He was screaming. It cannot have disappeared completely. That doesn't quite make sense, though, does it? In what way? Well, we'd understood that only Mr. Vigil was aware of the will's existence. Yeah. In which case, how did the prison governor know to look for it? Oh, yes, you're right! Was he the one that provided the paper? I really didn't know how he knew. But it certainly seemed as though he knew of the will's existence from the outset. Only he didn't refer to it as the will. What he said was... The Asogi Papers. Oh. The Asogi Papers? I really can't tell you anything of the sub subsequent events. Because, well, of what happened. Your dismissal, and the way you blocked it all from your memory. I've forgotten all this until today. I don't suppose it's relevant to the case, though. Well, anyway, thank you very much for sharing it with us, Mr. Vigil. We're very grateful. This poor man. Jesus. This guy really has had it rough. I'm afraid there's really little more I could tell you. My wife Evie will be here shortly. So I, I do hope I don't appear rude, but... No, no, not at all. Thank you again. But what will become of you now? Well, impersonating a police officer is a criminal offense, of course. I imagine that once I'm fully recovered, I shall be arrested. I'm so sorry. Don't be, please. This is all my own doing. I always knew that this day would come. Well, I wish you well. Goodbye, Mr. Vigil. I can defend you in court when that happens. Ah! Before you go, there's just one thing. Go! Oh, yes, Jesus Christ! What is it? <sighs> the Sogi Papers. I'd be very grateful if you'd make no mention of the things I told you about them. Presumably for some good reason. It's my understanding that their very existence was a closely guarded secret. If it became known that I'd remembered, well, it could be rather troublesome, I think. I understand. Hmm. Some sort of will that gets you a soggy pen just before his death. Which the man himself claimed was his last weapon. I wonder. Perhaps it had something to do with his plan to escape. Or maybe what happened afterwards. Is there anyone who might know more about a document the Cosmos father left behind? It would be Mr. Vigil's governor! Then we know precisely where we must go. Back to Barclay Prison. Damn, we're bouncing around like a little bunnies. This poor guy. Well, at least he seems to be on the mend. You know, his disguise as Mr. Gossip was really quite masterful, wasn't it? I can't remember anything about it except for the floppy lip. I imagine not even his wife could would have recognized him. Perhaps. But do you really have to take it quite so far? These must be the patient's treatment notes. Let's see. Tendency to jump from windows. <laughs> Remember to place cushions at base of wall outside. That's kind of fucked up. <laughs> Are we a story up from the ground here? Oh dear. Poor Mr. Vigil. I 
can't help feeling that there's a better solution to the problem than a cushion, though. Finding something you'd lost isn't always a happy experience, it turns out. Pursuing the truth can be a very dark business sometimes, can it? Yes, I'm afraid it can. Oh. All right, let's get the fuck out of here, dude. Is anything to the right of me? There's some crutches and shit. All right. <laughs> Damn, so all right. I was like, well, maybe the last location is going to be the forensic library. No, no, we're still gonna go to the, back to the fucking prison governor's office too. All right, November 2nd, Barclay Prison, governor's office. I like it. Don't bring up the Asogi papers to anyone. I'm gonna go bring it to this guy now, probably. Oh, back again, oh yeah. Um, yes, hello. I've heard all about your investigations. I read the reports just now. You found him, eh? Did you? Yes, luckily. Well, anywho, the laddie doesn't work here no more. So your case is now to do with, with Barclay. I would not like you to get the wrong idea about that. Of course, yes. Mr. Vigil stopped working here 10 years ago now, so. Look at that big ass bird back there. Yes, we seen his dismissal notice, haven't we? He was given the chop. Hi, Kimba. You can very well. So, how about a weak handcuff biscuit? <laughs> oh, they really are like little handcuffs. And as hard as irons, too. <laughs> so, what's brought you down here to the hit down here the day? Well, there's something else we'd like to ask you about, actually. Is that so? We believe there might have been a document that disappeared from Genshin Asogi's cell. I think it's been called the Asogi Papers or something. Did I not say? Greg's death is not to do with the things that might have happened to Barclay. Leave the past in the past, laddie. Let's not fooster about with irrelevant details. His expressions changed completely. We're clearly on to something here. But first, did we look at the bird? Yeah, we did. Look at that bird. Bird up. Ten-year-old legacy. The murder is boss execution. And they'll miserably es escape. They're Barclay's darkest hour, eh? A shock and embarrassment. Because the convict had a collaborator on the prison staff, you mean? Aye, for shame. The coroner who confirmed the death of the man after his execution got Nisarth. In my chief order at the time, Vigil, who was in the charge of the whole affair. But Mr. Vigil says he didn't know anything about it. The rascal would not say otherwise, eh? More handcuffs. <laughs> oh, how could I say no? They can never have too much iron in your diet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Vigil was handed his dismissal notice as a result of what had happened. He was so despairing, he jumped out your office window, didn't he? Yeah, I knew I should have put iron balls on this thing. I didn't like to say. That's just Vigil trying to get out of it. Do you not think he would have... Wouldn't have jumped out from the shock of his crimes being exposed, eh? I do. You wouldn't have say otherwise, though, would you? Of course, I can't have shown all responsibility myself. I shouldn't have let him deceive me. Actually, there's barely anybody that kins what went on at the time now. With Gregson having been murdered, Dr. Scythe forbidden from having any visitors. No visitors? Someone obviously doesn't want her giving anything away. Well, we're not going home empty-handed. And I wouldn't dream of sending you packing with not with a knot, Kimmer. Here, take a handcuff to two. Oh, well, it would be rude to say no. Wouldn't want to become an anemic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already liking this running gag. Hmm. I suppose there's anybody who wants who might still care about what happened back then. It'd be that last from the forensic division, Maria Gori. Maria Gori? Hey, so it's daughter. She didn't have no more. Just the one. Oh, God. That's who it is? Oh, of course. Of course it is. That's right. We did see her earlier. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And of course, her name would be Gori, right? Creepy ass girl. 
The wee bands fold in her mam's footsteps. You didn't ever want to see her without a scalpel in her hand. I ah. Yeah, yes, her. Mama, what is this? Ah, where did she spring from? And did she just call the doctor Mama? Dr. Sai's daughter, Maria Gori. We could do with talking to her. Gori. So, she's Dr. Sai's daughter, but her surname is Gori? Aye. That's a family history, I'm sure. But I didn't get in the ins and outs of it. So you're not watching a man working with the bodies of the folk who died in strange circumstances and decide to do the same with her own life. I can't even understand it myself. Perhaps she was driven by a deeper respect for her mother. Perhaps. Anywho, she was in charge of Gregson's autopsy, I believe. Right. In the coroner responsible for this incomplete report. Someone told me once that the wee lassie always loved her mum's stories, but couldn't help the bodies. There's even a rumor where she used to listen to the funeral marches of Lullaby. Ugh. Well, then perhaps her mother might have told her about the autopsy from the case ten years ago. Aye. I say it's a fighting chance, at least. After all, it was a life-changing case for all of us. Really need to speak to Miss Goria herself about this, I think. Well, thank you very much. I'm not happy about any part of this. It took years for Londoners to finally forget the whole professor business. Can you not get up and on this, laddie? Stop asking pointless questions. I'm sorry. I don't like dredging up these painful memories for everyone. Can you not just stay away, no? Leave me alone and Denny come back here, eh? But we gotta know about the papers, dude. How do you come to kidding about that, laddie? There's no many folks even here in the prison who've heard of those papers. Ah, well, I can't tell Mr. Vigil told me. I'm afraid our sources must remain confidential, sir. Huh. We've been led to believe the papers are actually a last will and testament. Is that right? The professors, or rather, Genshin Asogis. Aye, that's right. You're well informed, Jimmy. Oh, it's at the end of the silent treatment. But then after the convict's execution, it mysteriously vanished from his cell, didn't it? Have us know. You often have cork there. I think you didn't quite get your facts straight. It was there in the cell, exactly where it should have been. Oh, not what we heard elsewhere. Let me just have a wee hook around in here. So I can find it. Aye, here you are. See? The last will and testament of Genshin Asogi, written with a calligraphy brush. Of course, can I read a word of these Japanese squiggles? But I mind it says he leaves all his worldly possessions to his son back in his homeland. Yes, that's correct. That's the gist of it. So these papers are the Asogi papers. Aye, of course they are. Papers written by Sergei and I doubt about it. There's no mystery here, laddie. That's your lot. Oh, he's hiding some shit, for certain. After all the stromash of their slaster of an execution, we sent the man's positions back to his clan in Japan. And that was the end of it. I think we ought to make a record of this, Mr. Naruhoto. Just in case. The last one tes testament of Geshe Sogi that Mr. Visual claims disappeared after the convict's Execution. Apparently, Mr. Soki described it as the only weapon I have left. Well, think before you go on your way, Mr. Naruhodo. Oh, yes? There's papers. i not to deal with Gregson's death. I prefer if you didn't make no mention of them outside this office. Or rather, I wouldn't you just prefer it. Consider it an order from the highest levels of our government. I understand. <laughs> uh oh. Let's have a look-see doodle. Uh, last will and testament of Gensner Sogi. I, Gensner Sogi, hereby request that upon my death, any and all materials, possessions, and wealth belonging to me in London be delivered to my son, Cosmo Sogi, in the Empire of Japan. It is with deep sadness that I accept my fate in this foreign land, and the knowledge that I will never see my homeland or family again. 
but I regret nothing about my chosen path. Hmm. Nothing seemingly crazy about this. Are we missing some papers or some pages? Why is this such a closely guarded secret, seemingly? Hmm. Are we done here? I think we are. 